I found seven things you never want to write on business credit card applications. Have you ever felt like you're doing everything right, but still hitting devastating roadblocks when applying for business credit? You've worked hard and built your business from the ground up, and now you're ready to get funding to buy new equipment or supplies for that next client. But then, just as you're expecting that approval to come through, the email hits your inbox. Application denied. Your heart sinks and now you wonder where it all went wrong. To solve this, we got to talk about the income and revenue numbers you must stay below to avoid getting flagged for an account review, why misspelling even one character could derail your business funding opportunities, and why banks can look at your business as riskier than the next one even though you're in the same industry. But I need to let you know I just launched my 0% interest business credit card database. It comes with 500 plus banks that offer no interest for up to 18 months. You'll know exactly which credit bureau each bank pulls from, the top banks in your state offering 0% funding, and you'll see which banks let you open up multiple credit products with one hard pull. Plus, it includes every bank from my original 0% APR list. So just hit that link below to get instant access. Now, one of the most common and easily avoidable mistakes business owners make is confusing their EIN with their social security number on credit card applications. And believe me, this simple mix up can make the difference between getting that much needed capital or facing a denial that sets your business back by months. Your EIN number is like your business's identity. It's like your social security number for the business. Just like how you wouldn't put your cousin's name down on your personal credit application, your business deserves the same attention to detail. Your EIN is the gateway to building a robust business credit profile. It separates your personal financial life from your business world. When you mistakenly use your social security number instead of your EIN on a business application, you really blur that line and lenders hate blurred lines. And one of the most frustrating mistakes that many business owners make is misusing their DUNS number. When you're trying to build business credit, accuracy is everything. Yet it's so easy to get tripped up when juggling various numbers like your EIN number and your DUNS number. I've seen it happen countless times. You know, people mistakenly enter their DUNS number where their EIN number should go. And of course, they're thinking it's just another business identifier. But here's the thing, your DUNS number serves a completely different purpose. It's specific to Dun & Bradstreet and it's meant for certain credit profiles and business credit reports. So just imagine you fill out your application full of hope ready for that influx of funds that will help your business grow, only to face delay after delay. Lenders try to match your information to their records, but nothing lines up. You know the result? Automatic denial, or if you're lucky, just a painfully slow approval process. That's because entering your DUNS number where your EIN number should go confuses the lender system, and that makes it impossible to verify your business's credit worthiness. Not only can it lead to an outright denial, but it could also result in a credit limit that doesn't reflect the strength of your business credit. Imagine expecting $100,000 in funding and getting approved for only $10,000 or nothing at all, all because of one misplaced number. So your DUNS number and EIN aren't interchangeable. The DUNS is your business's identity in Dun & Bradstreet's world, but the EIN is the key to unlocking your broader credit opportunities with banks and lenders. Always make sure you're using the right number in the right place. Now, imagine this. You spent years building two businesses from the ground up. Maybe one is a logistics company with a fleet of trucks, while the other is a cleaning business you've been building from a dream into a reality. Both businesses are doing well, but now you need more funding to hire more employees and take your cleaning business to the next level. You think, why not leverage the trucks from my logistics business as collateral to secure a loan for my cleaning company? After all, it's all under your control, right? Well, here's where things get tricky and where many business owners stumble without realizing it. While the idea of using assets from one business to support another seems smart and efficient, lenders don't see it that way. In fact, mixing assets between businesses can be a major red flag that causes more harm than good. Lenders need clarity. They want to know exactly where their risk lies, and when assets from one business are used to support a loan for another, it muddies the waters. Imagine a lender trying to really make sense of why a cleaning business with its cleaning supplies and client base has trucks listed as collateral. 
It raises questions that can lead to hesitation or confusion or worse, outright denials. Lenders like to keep things simple and really aligned. When they issue credit, they want to know that that collateral backing the loan is directly tied to the business being funded. If the business fails, they need a clear pathway to recover their money through the assets of that business, not some separate entity in a completely unrelated industry. Now, let's say your cleaning business did secure a loan using its trucking assets. If your cleaning business had struggled or defaulted, the lender would have gone after the trucking assets and that would cripple your logistics business, which was doing just fine. And worse, by trying to use assets across different businesses, you risk making both companies look less organized and professional in the eyes of lenders. It's really a lose-lose situation that could have been easily avoided. So the moral of the story is separation is key. Just like you wouldn't mix your personal finances with your businesses, don't mix your assets between your businesses. It not only increases your chances of getting approved, but it also protects the long-term health of both companies. And speaking of personal finances, don't you hate it that most business cards require a personal guarantee to get approved? But here's the thing. There are a handful of business cards that flat out don't require a personal guarantee. That's why I just created the No PG Business Card Master List. It's got over 25 cards on there and counting right now. So your high usage will never affect your personal credit report. It just doesn't show up there at all. There's no hard credit pull whatsoever. Your credit score stays untouched. And here's a big one. If your business ever struggles and you have to shut it down for some reason, you can pretty much walk away debt free. You're not personally on the hook for repaying the money. So to get instant access to the no PG business card master list, just hit that link below. Now let's talk about income. One of the trickiest parts of any business credit application. You're sitting there staring at the form, wondering if you should play it safe or aim really high. After all, the more income you report, the better your chances of securing that much needed funding, right? Or maybe you're on the exact opposite end, feeling uncertain and not wanting to overshoot, so you downplay your business's earnings. In either case, you're not alone. Many business owners find themselves in this exact same tough situation, and both approaches can be costly. Here's the thing, banks and lenders live and breathe numbers. Income isn't just a figure on a page to them. It's a reflection of your ability to repay the money they're about to lend to you. So when it comes to reporting your income, getting it right is crucial. But this is where mistakes happen and they can have serious consequences for your business's future. Imagine this, you built a solid business, your revenue is steadily climbing, but you're nervous about how much to claim. You downplay your earnings, thinking it's better to be cautious. Maybe you're worried that reporting too much will come with strings attached, or maybe you simply don't realize all the income sources that you can include. After all, you don't want to be asked for a mountain of paperwork, right? But here's the truth. Underselling your income can be just as damaging as overselling it. When you report a lower income than what your business or household is actually bringing in, you're essentially shrinking your financial potential in the eyes of the lender. They might see that you're lower income and think, can this business really handle this loan? By downplaying your earnings, you could be shooting yourself in the foot, reducing your approval chances, or receiving a much smaller loan amount than you actually need. Now, on the other side, let's say you decide to go big. You decide to stretch the truth a little bit. After all, who's really going to check, right? If your business brings in $150,000 a year, why not round it up to three hundred dollars the bigger the number, the more likely you are to get approved for a larger loan, or so you think. But here's where the reality check comes in. Overselling your income can trigger red flags, leading to more scrutiny from the lender. Once you report your income over a certain threshold, that's going to be typically around $250,000, lenders start digging deeper. They might ask you for tax returns or profit and loss statements or financial documents to verify your numbers. And if you can't back up what you've reported, it can lead to delays, denials, and in some cases, serious damage to your credibility. A lot of business owners don't realize that they can include so many different streams of income on these applications. It's not just about what your business earns, your household income matters too. Pensions, retirement funds, alimony, stock dividends, it's all fair game. Banks wanna see the full picture of your financial health and by including these additional sources of income, you can dramatically improve your approval chances but only if those numbers are accurate and verifiable. 
And banks use your income to calculate your debt to income ratio or DTI, and they assess how much risk they're taking on. It's all really a balancing act. Too low and they doubt your ability to repay the loan. Too high and they start requesting documentation that you really might not have. Now the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle, reporting your true income, but not inflating or hiding anything either. Income misreporting is one of the easiest traps to fall into, but it's also one of the easiest to avoid if you know the rules of the game. Be thorough, be honest, and include everything you can back up. Now, we gotta talk about overstating your business revenue. We've all been there. You're filling out an application for business funding and you get to the revenue section. The temptation to inflate your business revenue creeps in. After all, you've worked so hard and maybe next year you'll hit that number anyway, right? It feels harmless. After all, if you're close enough, what's the harm in stretching the truth a little to secure a bigger loan? Well, unfortunately, that small exaggeration can have serious consequences. Now, imagine this. You're riding the wave of your business's recent success. Your sales are growing, new clients are coming in, and you're more confident than ever about the future. Now you're ready to take a big leap, maybe expand your operations or open a new location, and you need funding to make it happen. And you know, the bigger that your revenue looks, the more likely it is that you'll get approved for the amount you need. So instead of reporting 380K in revenue, which is your actual number in this case, you write 500K. At first you feel great, the application is in and you're already imagining how you'll use the extra funding to grow your business. But then reality hits, a few days go by and you get an email from the lender asking for documentation, tax returns, profit and loss statements, and financial reports. Suddenly, you're scrambling, knowing you can't back up the numbers you claim. Now the lender is starting to question everything about your application. Instead of moving forward, you're stuck. Banks and lenders don't just take your word for it. When you exaggerate revenue, they dig deeper. Lenders really have systems in place, cross-referencing industry averages, using tools like LexisNexis, and running checks on databases like early warning systems to see if your claims are realistic. They've seen every trick in the book, so when your revenue figures don't really align with what they expect for your business type and industry, alarms go off. So why does this happen? Once you hit certain revenue thresholds, especially anything above 425K, most lenders will require more documentation. It's not because they don't believe you, it's because they're forced to assess the risk of lending to your business accurately. And when you claim higher revenue, they'll wanna make sure you can back it up. If you can't, it sends a message that you're not operating with transparency, which is a huge red flag. When applying for business credit or loans, honesty is always the best policy. Don't try to stretch your revenue to fit what you think banks wanna see. Lenders are looking for consistency and accuracy, not perfection. You wanna report your actual numbers and be prepared to back them up with documents. It's about getting the right loan for where your business is today. Now, one of the most easily overlooked yet critical factors in business credit applications is your NAICS code. This is a six digit code that classifies your business into specific industries. It may seem like another number in a sea of paperwork, but to lenders, it's one of the first things they look at when evaluating risk. And getting it wrong can send your entire application into a nosedive. You might think that as long as your business is doing well, the classification shouldn't matter. After all, your revenue speaks for itself, right? But the reality is that lenders have specific guidelines for each industry, and some industries are deemed riskier than others. You know, take real estate, for example, or trucking. These sectors are seen as high risk because of market volatility or high insurance costs. If the next code identifies your business as being in one of those high risk industries, lenders may be more hesitant to approve you for larger lines of credit, or they may offer you a lower limit than you really expected. Now, here's where many business owners really trip up. It's not just about having the right next code, it's about having a consistent next code across all platforms. That means your next code needs to match across the IRS, your Secretary of State registration, your Dun and Bradstreet, and any other databases. If there's a mismatch in one of those places, it's gonna raise red flags. Lenders rely on these systems to verify that your business is exactly what you claim it is. Inconsistencies make it look like your business is disorganized, or worse, like you're trying to game the system. And this might surprise you, but even businesses within the same industry can have different NAICS codes. For example, a real estate developer, a real estate broker, and a property manager all operate in the real estate industry, but they have different risk profiles. 
lenders will evaluate them differently. So if you're applying for funding as a real estate developer, but you accidentally classify yourself as a property manager, you're sending the wrong message. You're misrepresenting the level of risk associated with your business, which can lead to confusion, delays, and even denials. So before applying for any business credit or loan, double check your next code. Make sure it accurately reflects what your business does and is consistent across all the platforms where your business is registered. And then you want to make sure your business name, your legal structure, and next code match perfectly across the board. Now, the number one most frustrating and easily avoidable mistake is having inconsistent business names across your documents. It's like trying to unlock a door with the wrong key. It may look close enough, but close isn't good enough. Lenders are really meticulous about details and any inconsistency in business name across platforms can slow down or derail the entire process. You might think a minor difference like having LLC on your IRS documents, but not on your secretary of state registration is no big deal. After all, it's still the same business, right? But not in the eyes of the bank. For lenders, consistency is everything. Your business name needs to match exactly across all documents and databases from the IRS to your business bank accounts to Dun & Bradstreet. Even a small discrepancy like using an abbreviation in one place and the full name in another can cause confusion and red flags during the underwriting process. When lenders review your application, they want to verify that every piece of information checks out. They pull records from various sources like the IRS, Secretary of State, Dun & Bradstreet, and sometimes even your website. If your business name isn't consistent across all these platforms, they really can't be sure that you're operating the business as described. This opens the door to suspicion. At best, it will slow down your application as they request clarification or additional documents. At worst, it will lead to an outright denial, forcing you to restart the process all over again. So before applying for business credit cards, take some time to do a full scan of your business name across all of these platforms. Check your business bank accounts, tax filings, registrations with the Secretary of State, Dun & Bradstreet, and any other documentation where your business name appears. Make sure everything matches perfectly. Also, if you've recently rebranded or changed your business structure, don't assume that updating one platform is enough. You'll need to update your business name across every database from government registrations to credit bureaus to your website and social media profiles. Even those small discrepancies can cause big problems, so it's worth taking the time to get it right. Now, once you've made sure your business name is consistent across the board, you're in a solid position to start building business credit without relying on your personal social security number. With strong business credit, you can fund your business without constantly worrying about stretching your personal credit too thin. So check out the next video where I not only show you how to build your business credit fast, but also seven business cards you can get without a personal guarantee. Thank you for watching.